Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today's question is, to what extent could gaps in learning affect chances in later life? And I'm in conversation with Victoria Carr. Okay, so my name is Dr Victoria Carr. I am currently a primary school head teacher in my second headship. Uh, in the northwest of England in a little place called Ellesmere Port. I have been in education for about 25 years and I am a huge advocate for lifelong learning. And our question today is to what extent could gaps in learning affect chances in later life? Now you can jump off wherever you want with that, that feels like a massive massive (laughs) question, so where do we start? Um, I think it is a huge question isn't it? Um, I think Sometimes educators tend to be quite entrenched in their own education phase. So at primary level, I might be thinking about gaps in education there. Or if I was uh, in just a junior school or just an infant school, I might be thinking about gaps in education at that level. If I was secondary colleague, perhaps in that sense. And also, of course, special needs colleagues in in special schools and so on. So I think um, in terms of the broader question, can gaps in learning uh, affect people in later life? I guess it depends on which gaps and on how they are evidenced. So particularly at the moment, if you are a parent of a teenage child, I'm a parent of two teenagers, one who should have done their GCSEs last year and one who should be doing them this year. Um, For me, the huge debate at home um, has been around how that will look and how that will influence them as they move through into the next part of their lives um, and whether it will affect their career chances, Uh, their sort of further education opportunities and so on. So we've done an awful lot of uh, talking around this at two different levels, because one of my children is um, completely anti-academia. He's um, dyslexic and has hated school his whole life, which is so painful for me because of course I absolutely love anything um, academic, but he, he is the opposite. Um, so for him, he has a different viewpoint for my daughter, um, who actually goes to the same selective school that I went to as a teenager. Um, there's a completely different vibe, completely different pressures and uh, different expectation on her, I think, at school level. But also that's translated into upon her as an individual. So I think it influences mental health, which I think can have long term impact, certainly on, on outcomes and life chances. Um, And that all kind of depends on your support network at home, I think. And then if you track that down into those younger children, yeah, I I still also think it does have an impact on mental health. I mean, some children last year particularly worried that they didn't get to do their SATs and what that might look like in secondary school. And that's what got me thinking about the whole topic, actually, because I thought, you know, no matter what level you are at in education, the, na- the narrative and the dialogue around that level and what you are not going to get seems to be overshadowing you thinking about what you've achieved and what you can still yet achieve given the support that, that is actually out there. And I think a colleague of mine, her daughter um, was just completing her, her degree last year and she was exactly the same. So it, I think it just reiterates the view that it can have an impact, but the extent to which it has that impact largely depends on your perspective Um, your support network at home and the uh, ability of the people who receive you if you like whether that's the workplace um, or the secondary school or the 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 a-level college or or even the the sort of um, university campus those those people who receive you knowing that you've had two disrupted years in your education can be really beneficial to you in terms of that um, mitigation for, for it not having a too detrimental an impact but I think as educators as well, it's made me more aware as a head teacher, as an employer, of people who uh, are newly qualified teachers. Not only was their final year of their degree influenced by a pandemic, but also their entire um, postgraduate year as well, when they've been studying the actual art of teaching. So for them, they're going to come to me potentially as a newly qualified teacher, having had two disrupted years. And it's incumbent upon me to make sure that that kind of uh, is sustainable for them that they don't feel overwhelmed doing the actual day job as well as filling those gaps that they may have had in terms of their experiences or their learning beforehand. So I think, yes, there will be small gaps, but I don't think it has to have such a negative impact as perhaps has been portrayed in the press or bandied around really um, in popular dialogue. 
And I think it's it's important to note, really, isn't it, quite how doom mongering uh, the kind of rhetoric has been around uh, sort of children's life chances. I'm the mum of two children in year six right now, and um, they go up to secondary school in September. And I guess that whichever age or stage your children are at, you're very tuned into the, you know, what's being said about that age. But, you know, if I believed everything I read and I've tuned into all the negatives, I mean, I might as well just give up now. And, and you know, it feels like there's no no future for them. Um, and actually, of course, we know that not to be true, but what are the things that we can be doing as parents, as educated, as other supporting adults in the lives of children and young people right now? What do you think we can be doing to, as you said, mitigate the impact of, of these gaps that, that some of our children might have experienced? Well, I think first and foremost, it's um, filtering the messages that they get to hear. Um, I know it's hard as a parent, I, particularly as your children get older, to kind of um, watch what they watch and watch the diet of what they see and what they take in um, outside of your home. I do understand it's hard, but I think, you know, if you have a choice of where to send your child, it's, worth, it's well worth looking at the attitude and the ethos of the school that your child goes to. If your child attends a school where there is this kind of... Uh, it's kind of sticking to the doom mongering rhetoric I, I think I'd be disinclined to, to be involving myself with that I think it's a shame when that does happen because parents have a doubly hard job at home in order to to manage the, the narrative around their children but I do think that language and that discussion with our children no matter their age um, is really important again no matter that the pandemic I'm a huge advocate for language and its influence on young minds particularly and, and how they view themselves because this whole a lost generation and so on imagine if that really got under the skin of the generation of children that we're talking about and they just decided that well everyone thinks we're lost we've been written off and what does that do to you as, as a small person does that you know stunt your ability to see yourself as as anything other than just someone who's been lost or robbed of or starved of education and I think it's really sad because we as parents, you know, our, our first and foremost responsibility needs to be around that mental health because without children feeling safe, mentally safe, emotionally safe and secure, it's very difficult for them to access any other kind of learning in their lives. And, you know, 50% of that has to come from school, obviously, but 50% of that has to come from home as well. So I think just explaining to children and having those open conversations about how, you know, people have survived um, in many respects, people have survived a lot worse than this um, and, and done really well. And I think particularly at the moment, we can highlight the fact, even for small children, that things like refugees um, traveling and making those awful journeys from war-torn countries to our country for safety and, and safe harbor are still able to access education and do very well at various kind of key points in their education life, whether that's uh, a levels or degree level or, or further education they're still able to access that and some of them arrive here with without um, English as their first language so not only do they have those awful um, early life experiences but they also have the English uh, language barrier as well to overcome and when I started to explain that to my daughter she at the penny actually dropped that she, it wasn't terrible to miss a, a few weeks of school and actually in the grander scheme of things had she broken her leg playing rugby or you know, done something that is quite kind of standard stuff, you know, a, a, break, a broken bone or, you know, sadly a car accident could have could have stopped her going to school for a number of weeks in the same way that a pandemic has. So actually it's not this lost generation. It, it, it's a bit of lost learning that can be caught up on if it's, um, you know, going to be tested or examined in some way, but it's largely not going to have this terrible, terrible impact. That, it, that people are, are perceiving that it might have. So I think parents taking a pragmatic approach and pointing out that um, the realities, rather than just letting their children have this diet from the press of um, how they're lost and, and how it's all terrible, is the most beneficial thing that anyone can do at the moment. And listening to their children talk, listening to their worries and their fears and suggesting practical ways that those can be overcome. And I think the the power of adults to kind of change the course of children's lives and their sort of self belief is something you talk about really powerfully in your TEDx talk, which I'll, I'll link to in in the show notes. And you 
talk about how you know somebody having uh, some belief in you that you perhaps didn't have in yourself at a very young age you talk about that being kind of life-changing is that something you'd be happy to talk a little bit about I mean how what, what was said and how that changed things for you yeah absolutely I, I, I do think that it's it's hugely important for grown-ups to be very careful and mindful of what they say to children um, for me personally I, you know, I, I didn't have the greatest start in life, not because, um, you know, I wasn't loved or because, um, you know, we came from a war-torn country or anything like that, but because my father had significant mental health issues, which we now know and understand. Um, but back then, you know, 40, 50 years ago, people didn't really understand um, mental health. There wasn't the kind of the body of knowledge that there is now around um you know birth to five really when he was born he was born in the war his father was away his mother was uh, po po poverty stricken and needed um to put, put him into a home and a children's home in those war-torn years of the 1940s just wasn't a kind of loving home he wasn't he didn't get that key caregiving that that we know that we, we need now so he was unable to form healthy uh, relationships with people. He had a very unhealthy uh, relationship with my mother, who was a lot younger than he was. And he was a violent schizophrenic. So our lives as small children were um, terribly overshadowed by, by violence, sexual violence, as well as um, physical violence. And um, it was a terrifying place to live. And it was school, actually, that... Uh, was the answer to all of that was the antidote to it largely school and the fact that I had an extended family who took over when he killed himself um, and kind of supported my young mother through the aftermath of that trauma and with four young children um, all under eight we you know we, we were held we were held um, and contained really emotionally contained by, by our extended family and a, a sort of teacher saying to my to my nan and my mum that I was university material it was a throwaway comment perhaps from her but it, what it meant was that suddenly there was this conversation around me and, and I said it in my TEDx talk where nobody had ever been to university before in my family ever 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 before um, that, that's not to say they weren't you know intelligent articulate clever individuals both my grandparents had their own businesses um, in in the sort of 60s and 70s they're very wealthy they own their own home we come from um the heart of Liverpool, a place called Toxteth, where there were riots at the end of, of my street when I was a small child and so on. So at a time when all that was happening and in an area where um, we weren't, it wasn't very affluent, my grandparents were um, very affluent. So it wasn't to do with not being hardworking or not being, which is often what what's the kind of criticism that's levied at working class families that they're not hardworking or they're lazy or what have you that was never the case it was just that through circumstances the war stopped both of my grandparents attending secondary school um, and they never had the backing of their own parents who were working class so they simply went on and worked hard and generated businesses and so on but for me it was this conversation around you're going to university and then that combined with the death of my father meant that we moved house and we moved into an area on the Wirral where the 11 plus was still there. And because I used to hide in books and, you know, lost myself uh, there to sort of hide away from the realities of my life, I, I was, I en it ended up that I was quite academic. So it was just through three kind of things converging on one another really that meant I ended up at this grammar school and they just reiterated all of those messages I'd had for the previous sort of three or four years of university, university, university. Um, and that, that's what happened. Um, I, I went there and, and off I went to university. So I, I do think that that early conversation, that early message was so kind of vital to me. And it was one throwaway comment from a teacher. And so you might think that's a one off. And, and then I think possibly, you know, it, it could have been classed as that, except many, many years later, I had uh, I had to take some time off work for the first time ever, actually, after having had a double mastectomy and lots of people reached out to come and see me and sort of cheer me up because they knew I was such an active person that to be at home and doing nothing for weeks would just be awful. Um, and one of those people uh, was a teaching assistant um, who had worked with me in a previous job and she'd completed her level one um, NVQ and I hadn't met her before I was new to the school and I was in the staff room making a cup of tea and she came in to tell someone else I've just I've just done my level one and I just said a throwaway comment oh you're not going to stop there are you she didn't know me from Adam I didn't know her 
And some months later, she came for a job at the school. She'd, she'd been doing a training there. She hadn't been working. And she came for a job and she got the job. And then I said, oh, you know, are, are you going to do the level two? And she said, oh, yeah, I've already enrolled. She didn't tell me why, but she said, yeah, I've already enrolled. So she was doing the level two. And then again, some months later, she completed that. And I said, what about doing um, a HLTA? And again, it was just over coffee. Um, nothing that I would class as a professional conversation, as a coaching conversation, just a coffee chat where you're making a cup of tea and off you go to your work. So when she came to see me a few years later and I'd had the surgery and I was quite, quite down in the dumps and she said, you must know the influence that you have over people. She said, all you said to me that day was um, you're not going to stop there. And she said, it just lit a spark in my head. And I thought, actually, that's right why, why would I stop there and she said and I haven't and then each tiny bit of encouragement you gave me she said I hung off those words like like they were gold dust and, and here I am and I've you know I've done this HLTA work now and, and now she's a really well respected specialist in dyslexia and works um, you know doing a very specialized program uh, and I haven't worked with her now for, for two schools sort of nine years but um she came to find me after I'd had surgery to tell me that. And, and I thought that was really profound in the same way that I was able to say to the teacher who said to my mum, this girl's university material, randomly I came across her in a synagogue in Liverpool again, many years later. Um, her husband was doing a talk and she'd just retired and it blew my mind that I was able to sort of say, oh my word, <laughs> you know, you said this to me and, and I was this huge person and um, she was still as diddy as ever and, and she couldn't believe it. You know, I think a lot of them thought that something terrible had happened to my family because we were gone overnight. Um, you know, there was a lot of police involvement towards the end and so on. And, and I think nowadays I'd be classed as at least child protection, if not something a bit more. But um, yeah, she was delighted to hear that, um, you know, our family had not just survived, but thrived. You know, I've got some great, couple of great sisters. One got midwife of the year. I've got a lovely sister who survived terrible cancer and is a teaching assistant at my school. My brother's been in the RAF. He's a really, a really cool, cool guy. So I think the fact that she could hear from me that our family had not just survived, but done, done well and, and was living, you know, we're all living good lives really mattered to her. So yeah, I think you could class those comments as throwaway, but I don't, I don't think they are. And I think they stick with people. One word, one sentence, one conversation can have a huge impact on people that we just don't know sometimes. Uh, and I think that's always something that we have to to remember and accept, isn't it, when we're working in education, that we work hard every day to have those interactions, sometimes without even knowing the, the, the ripple um, that that will happen. Sometimes we never do know. You might never have come back across that teacher, but yet she had made that tremendous difference to you. Does it shape how you lead your school? The fact that for you as a child, and, and hearing you talk about it is exactly how I felt about school as well. My home life was was not so radically different than 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 yours. Um, and school was that place that was safe. It was full of these adults I could rely on and it was full of things I could do and get right. And um, it was a really, really wonderful place um, for me. And and I yeah, I wonder how that affects you as a head. Do you try to create that for your children, too? hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, first and foremost, we create safety and we are advocates for children. And that involves some painful conversations with, with parents, with external agencies, um, lots of headaches, lots of sleepless nights, but I know the difference that it makes. So it definitely drives me. It doesn't even influence me. It drives me to, to make sure that our school is that uh, for every child that comes in. And, and the days that I feel like we might not be getting it wrong are, are days that it, it's so painful to me. I, I, you know, I, I uncover every stone that, that we can find in order to, to make sure that it's, it is put right. If we receive children who haven't yet had that support from a different school, then we are all out to make sure that they, that they get it. It doesn't necessarily make us popular, um, but it, you know, I think everybody sees that we are 100% advocates for those children. Um, yeah, it, it does, it really does influence the way that I lead. And it influences how I am with my colleagues because I know that if I'm not creating an environment where each of my colleagues is the best that they can be, the happiest, the most content, the most settled, the most secure, then because I know that adults and children co-regulate, I know that they will not be able to provide that for the children that, that we work with. And now that I'm no longer a teacher, I don't have that kind of 
access to children where I can be the person who they see every day smiling at them, making their day wonderful. So I have to make sure I am that person for all of my staff, over 90 of them at the moment, to make sure that when they do come across children, then they are happy and, you know, that, that, that the influence they have is what I would do myself. So it's kind of a trickle, a trickling effect, I suppose. And you said that it doesn't always make you popular. I'm interested to know a little bit more about that. Uh, <laughs> well, when you are kind of vying for limited resources at local authority level for individual children and to meet their needs or have to try to meet their needs in a mainstream setting, it can get quite challenging. Um, you know, all of those agencies are under pressure. They're all being starved of money. And this isn't to do with the pandemic. It's exacerbated by the pandemic. But this austerity has happened for a long, long time. Schools have been underfunded. The social infrastructure of our country has been underfunded for a long time. And inevitably, that has an impact on families. And when things impact on families, it impacts on children, which then has an impact on your school. So it's kind of inextricable. You can't separate out one aspect from another. So when you are fighting a school for resources for the children that you serve, you have to sometimes uh, be quite vocal about that. And all I can imagine is at the other end, and I do try and be um, kind and obviously um, you know, magnanimous, but I am nevertheless fighting for the children in my school. So therefore I have to be the advocate and, and not let go, be tenacious and and my Senko is the same. You know, I have people around me who are exactly like that. We all of us are fighting all the time to, to try and get those limited resources for our children. Um, and, and I can imagine that that would not make me very popular. Yeah, but I guess if you're, yeah, you're on the side of the child every time. And I suppose every time, where the, yeah, where the reward really lies, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And that's a moral imperative, I think. I really do. So, um, yeah, it's one of the things I often um, suggest that people come back to because we can end up in these kind of situations where we're at loggerheads, can't we? And when we really keep our eye on the child and what's best for them, sometimes that can help us to make uh, better decisions and to find at least a little bit of cohesion. I wonder how it is for you in your role now and having achieved a lot in your life. You know, you've achieved your, your PhD, you're a head teacher. Everything looks really wonderful. And what would your childhood self think of this person and how can you inspire children like the child you once were to believe that it is possible to achieve these things because did it would that have felt possible to yourself as a child do you think no never I didn't have that kind of role model I didn't have that kind of person to look to it I, I don't re I don't recall ever thinking that I, rem I remember um being a child of the 70s we got milk in school in cartons and on the side of the cartons were different kind of countries and the kind of stereotypical things that would signify the country and I always used to want to get the Kenya milk because it had animals on it and the books I used to read were about adventurers I, I read every single Enid Blyton book I read every single book written by a chap called Willard Price so I used to dream daydream about going off on adventures and being strong and um being in nature and I I never would have dreamed that I could be somebody who who does this job or I suppose has influence over the lives of others I just I suppose I used to daydream about being strong and, and being invincible and um having these amazing adventures in in the environment so what I would say what I try to do now is to create curricula that show children that there is life outside of the life that they might know or, or they may have come to know to that date. That is probably all I can do, which is why I'm passionate about things like outdoor learning and um, those enhanced kind of learning experiences like residentials and things that build character and resilience and understanding and just diversify your thinking really. I, I love doing things like philosophy for children um, I would have had that as a whole staff thing had uh, the pandemic not kind of uh, put, put a stop to that uh, temporarily. But I think teaching children how to think, teaching them how to question things and not just to accept whatever they're told, I think is really important. I think the more they do of that, the more they can see that there, there are opportunities out there. I mean, there are jobs even now that my children talk about and I think, 
I have, I have no idea what that is. Um, so I suspect it'll be the same anyway for the children of today. There'll, there'll be jobs cropping up over time that, that just evolve because the world is an ever evolving place. But I think it's having the skills to be able to say, okay, I could reach for that. I, I want the children, and, and in fact, the adults I come across, I want them to think anything is possible, I can reach. Because it isn't just children that I think you influence as a leader. I think I'm often asked to talk to newly qualified staff or um, you know, people who are considering doing a PGCE or special needs staff. And I think if I can say to them, yeah, look, you know, you look at me and you think, oh, you know, she does this great job. She's really successful. But actually, it hasn't always been like that. And there are lots of times when I'll think, I don't know if I'm qualified. I don't know if I'll be able to. And each time what I've done and, and my secret in life, really, I suppose, is just to take a deep breath and take the step. And even if you're at first kind of reaching out into the dark, you know, you, you will not fall because even if you're only 50% qualified, and there's a statistic, isn't there, out there about how men will just apply for any old job, but women will want to tick every single box. Um, I think channel that, that inner man and just apply for the job because there are ways that you can train yourself. There, are, and, and that's the reason largely why I've gone ahead and done loads of study alongside my work is because I've always wanted to be informed by the most recent research, the most up-to-date stuff so that I can do the best possible job I can do. And I think that's the same on, on professional levels as well. If you reach for the deputy headship, if you reach for the head of year or whatever, and you're not sure if you can do it, you will do it. The quality to, that you bring to that will depend largely on your experiences to date and also on your determination to be the best that you can be and continue to supplement your day job with more academic uh, research based information that you can then develop in your own work. So that that's kind of if, if I could have articulated that in child speak, I would say to myself, looking back, um, keep going, you know, because you will survive your childhood and in fact, I had a bit of counselling a few years ago now, gosh, a long time ago, to do with this whole thing. And um, the, the counsellor said, I'm not going to talk to you, the successful, um, vibrant, you know, lovely individual. I'm going to talk to the child that should have, this should have been said to you when you were five, six, seven. And at, in all the years that I've been kind of surviving my life and thriving in it, really, I'd never thought of it in that way. And it, it was the first time that I'd actually cried about anything that had happened to me as a child was when I actually thought, you know, there was a child there um, trying to survive and, and feeling like they were failing in terms of protecting themselves, protecting their siblings, protecting their parent, whatever. But there was nothing that you could do other than survive it. And, and, and those kind of conversations about um, talking to your, your younger self, I think could benefit everyone. What would you say to yourself five years ago or before you did that? How would you, you know, because that's what you're talking about, not making those mistakes again in the future. If you can hear a noise, by the way, it's the school dog. <laughs> Tell us about the school dog. The school dog is just actually eating um, cucumber celery, which appears to have given him a bit of energy. And now he's emptied his toy box. And there are toys all over the floor. So he's obviously like a school child or my own children, in fact, where <laughs> I'm distracted on the screen and he's thinking, I'm going to get her attention. <laughs> <in> the toys <laughs> everywhere. But he's lovely. He's a black lab. He's called Gus. Um, I've had him now three weeks and I'm training him um, to come in and be a companion dog in school. It's another layer to the sort of well-being offer that I want for the children and the, and the staff in school. But what it means is that my sleep that was not very much in the first place is now even less <laughs> and, and all my spare time now is spent um training him but he's adorable he is absolutely adorable and what other measures do you have in place to support the children so school dogs so that what, what, what are the other things that you have um well i've trained a couple of the staff to become elsas i don't know if you've heard of this um acronym before emotional literacy support um assistant elsa and essentially they are trained by educational psychologists to support children with their emotional um, uh, resilience, development issues, et cetera. Um, so I've got two of them at the moment currently trained and two more being trained. Um, and that they are so good at it that actually they, they go out and talk to people in our local authority about it. So they're really good. We've got some counselors. Uh, we've got a learning support mentor as well. Here he comes to sit on my feet. Um, 
and we do a lot of talking therapies as well and um yeah so we have the the kind of therapeutic side of things and then the practical side of things so in terms of building some of those skills in order to be able to ask children to talk about what what troubles them or what they're doing we've brought in a program called commando joe's which is a character education program i don't know if you've heard of it it's it is countrywide um, and it's a really good uh holistic program that talks about all different aspects of character so that children can begin to develop uh, and articulate explicitly some of those elements of themselves that they want to um yeah and then our children who've got special um, needs will be put into various different kinds of programs like um the, there are different talking therapy programs that we've got as well which i'm sure lots of schools have and presumably when you're recruiting as well it sounds like you've got a bit of an idea about the sorts of people who fit within within your school <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean Anybody, I always chat to people I, before you get to the formal interview stage. It's if you can, it's always worth a chat. The last um, jobs we advertised for this time last year, we had over 400 applicants and the office staff said, you're banned. You're actually banned from being on social media because you're telling everyone what a great school we are. And the next minute <laughs> we're inundated, which was quite hilarious. But what I think is important and what I always say to any candidates who are shortlisted is uh, you're all equally qualified for the job. There's no doubt about it. But the point of an interview is for you to see whether you can work with me and for me to see whether I can work with you because my team is so cohesive and so child-centered and, and we just have the best fun. I don't particularly want to chance it with someone who isn't that way inclined. It has to be children first and it has to be people who are a bit different, who are going to bring some interesting things to the table. I don't want someone who's going to come and talk to me about data and how great they are at, at, at data management and stuff. I think that can be taught to anyone. I want someone who's going to come and say to me, I want to make life better for children. I want to think about innovative, creative ways to do that. And the rest I can teach them really. Um, so yeah, and it's last year we did this interview thing. I said, we, you can't come in because it's locked down, but you could, we could do socially distance interviews where you teach us how to do something that you feel passionately about. So we got to see how they would break um, something complex down into it, just like teaching children really. And a couple of the people we gave the job, one person taught me how to um, ice and decorate a cake, which I've never done in my life before. And then we got to eat the cake that was nailed on. She got the job. <laughs> But also it was just how she was and how she talked about this passion of hers. And I thought, yeah, she would be absolutely lovely. And she has just been a brilliant addition. And, and someone else taught us how to do these really complicated um, kind of like brain puzzles that you can make out of card and string. And it blew my mind. I thought, my goodness, this girl needs to come and work for us and, you know, keep my brain active. But um, yeah, she's wonderful as well. And um, I think although it was a really quirky thing to do, the third one who we appointed taught us how to tap dance. It was just hysterical. I've got three left feet, never mind two. And she had us tap dancing in the room, all socially distanced and taught us the, di the different moves and so on. So I think they probably thought it was the most bizarre experience of their lives. But the point is, I wanted to know that they could have a laugh with us. And, you know, I wanted to see them, the human being that was going to come and work with me. Because I tell you what, you're in your workplace many, many, many hours of your life. And as a teacher, you give up your weekends, your evenings and so on. And if you're not happy with your colleagues, it can be a very bleak, miserable place to be. So the people that work with us now are all equally crackers, um, but, you know, all child centred. <laughs> <laughs> sounds fantastic and what plans have you got for the for the summer term so we're speaking at the end of the kind of easter break um and obviously it's been a really disrupted year and a bit for everyone um and i know lots of schools have got various plans to try and build that sense of community again and help children to settle and get ready for next year what are your plans well, we started just before the holiday um, with good old Gus. We, rather than ch children coming straight back into school and, and hitting the books, we just, I said, we'll do a whole school project. I'd already um, sourced the, the breeder and, and kind of identified the dog that we were going to get. So the community, the sense of community that came from getting a school dog, I, I couldn't even have predicted it. It was just crazy. Um, so everyone wanted to, to come up with a name and then, that all the staff are so amazing they, they decided to do this kind of menu of, of projects that children could do both during the holidays and also as homework mm -hmm. um to, to build into the holidays and, and it was around everything so 
they designed um, harnesses, uh, uh, menus for food, um, dog agility things, and all kinds of different skills that, that, you know, are obviously part of the national curriculum. But rather than it being a stressful event coming back to school, they were just completely excited about planning for our school dog. So the summer term, we'll be integrating him in. By half term, he will be in school. But obviously, he's, he's a puppy, um, as you can hear, and um, he will need a little bit more training b before that happens. But, and then it'll be slowly integrated. And in fact, I've just bought a trailer for my bike, my push bike, and he's going to go in the trailer and be push biked <laughs> to school. Um, so he's going to have his own little trailer and so on. So getting him integrated into school, I think, will be massive. And then working with the PTA on some fun things as well. Can't really say anything too much about that because it'll give the game away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and also try and think about something creative because poor old year six last year did not get the, the send off that I wish they'd had. And we, we kind of half thought we'd do something when it all calmed down, not thinking for a minute it would then take another year. Mm. So I think for them that moment is lost. But I'd like to certainly mark the event uh, for the current year sixes um, with, with some interesting things. And again, part of that will be with the PTA. But yeah, just having as much fun as we can, doing as much outdoor learning and practical learning uh, as we can, trying to, to kind of bridge those gaps that children may or may not have. We, we found largely that it's not, it's not drastic because most of them did... Um, engage with that online learning you know at the start of the year and it was you know it was of such a good quality from the teachers even though we didn't do live lessons on purpose um so that parents could access them whenever they wanted um you know the, the quality was such that that all of the children did really well and again we had offset inspection just before february half term um a monitoring visit because the school that i took over of course was it was in a very tricky um position we've made lots of improvements but sadly because of the pandemic they couldn't come in and kind of rubber stamp those improvements um but they came in they came anyway and did um remote a two-day remote monitoring visit just before february half term so with that all kind of being done it means that we can focus on uh, on having as much as much productive fun as we possibly can Absolutely. And you, you said in, um, in our kind of correspondence before we met today um, that you think we should all focus more on love. And I just wanted to make sure I touched on that before we um, wrap things up, really. What, tell me more about that. Why does that matter and what do you mean? I think at a time in our generation where the whole world is hurting, what better time than to, to lead with love and to do all things with love? I think if more people thought first about um, the kinds of things that they said publicly and if they tried to um, take a more pragmatic approach to, to things I think there'd be less public spats in the press in social media I, I think if more people took a deep breath before they said things to one another by email or you know at the school gate or whatever there'd be less heartache and, and, and stress um, and I just think if everybody just took a moment and thought everyone's dealing with things in their own lives that none of us know anything about and I mean it's very well publicized that, that that kind of thing happens where people are literally battling with demons that none of us know about and if more of us really took cognizance of that um, and thought twice before we said something unkind I really do think that, that in our small way we could contribute to a much more productive much happier society sadly I think there are a lot of people who are trying to I don't know I heard this expression again this year called click bait I think where you just say something outrageous so that people will click on your th and I think why would anybody do that but apparently it is a thing and and I think that that's I don't know a sad indictment of of, of the way the world has, has gone but I genuinely think that um now is the time to lead with love and I know I do it and I know lots of people um also do it so I think it's important mm -hmm.